one of the more consequential aspects of the Jewish experience in the late Roman period is the development of something called the adversus judeos tradition. Uh, this is a group of ideas and ultimately policies that were developed by the church fathers in the late Roman period. Adversus Judeos, the, the title is generic, it's taken from a series of sermons uh, delivered in the 4th century by St. John Chrysostom, who we'll speak about in just a few minutes. Uh, it translates as against the Jews. Uh, or as they say here in the United States, against the Jews. Besides the regional differences, because there are clear distinctions to be made between those ideas that were generated in regions where um, Jews had very little population base and it was an increasingly Gentile environment, and those areas where there was much more of a mixed population and non-Jews actually interacted with Jews on a significant level. Um, but it's also really important to note that Christianity becomes a state religion in the early 4th century with the adoption and approval of Christianity by the Emperor Constantine. And so these ideas that begin as kind of theological disputes, uh, you know, uh, early Christian thinkers uh, trying to uh, articulate the identity of Christianity against a background of Judaism uh, and largely theoretical kind of ideas, which may have had more of a uh, rhetorical import than a physical one, become much more policy ideas once Christianity is joined with the empire. And so uh, some of the ideas which are, you know, uh, perhaps understandable in a rhetorical environment and people speaking and, you know, hyperbole and things like that, they can become actually quite significant when there's real power behind those ideas. Well, anyways, let's have a look at a couple of uh, of the aspects of this adversus Judeus tradition in particular. Let's start with Justin Martyr, shown here, and I have to tell you as a quick sidebar, uh, as I was looking, as I was preparing this lecture, I came across this amazing book on the internet. Here's the citation, André TV, Les vrais portraits et vies des hommes illustres grecs, latins et païens. So, translation is, uh, the true portraits and the lives of these men uh, from Greece, um, Rome, and I'm not sure what payens means. I, I think it means uh, peasant, which really doesn't make sense to me. But at any rate, 16th century book that illustrates the true portraits of these people, which I find absolutely amazing and hardly credible. Uh, although some of the images, like Socrates, for example, seem to be taken from busts that are from the Greek period. So maybe a couple of them are more accurate than others. But otherwise, it's hard to believe that this 16th century work actually portrays these people for real, but nevertheless really cool. Okay, so here's uh, Justin Martyr. As you can see, he was called Justin the Philosopher as well. He lived in the second century, very important early thinker. And among his many works was a book called The Dialogue with Trifo, which is essentially a dialogue with a Jew. And uh, Justin Martyr uh, really takes a lot of the ideas that were nascent in the Gospels and uh, develops them uh, to articulate a rather harsh approach to Judaism as a whole. Uh, first off, he clearly makes a distinction between his vision of Christianity, which is ethereal and spiritual and based on ideas and morality and emotion, as opposed to Israel, the Jews, uh, who are carnal in nature, uh, dedicated to really, you know, like earthly things like sacrifices and blood and like which spoon went into which pot? Was it a meat spoon and a milk pot and things like that? And he wants to say essentially that the Jews are all wrapped up in physicality and that's a negative thing, whereas Christians are much more thinking about, you know, the uh, more spiritual aspects of life. This is an unfair characterization, but nevertheless, it creates a kind of a dichotomy that will be repeated over and over again in many uh, Christian thinkers over the centuries. He also, at the same time, and it, it seems to me a little bit contradictory, that while he's putting down the Jews for their carnality, he's saying, and besides, we're the real Jews. Christians are the quote-unquote true Israel. That is, that what the Jews were doing with all of those mitzvot, all of those commandments, those were 
totally wrong and totally physical and not the way God wanted it to go. Christianity, which has abandoned all of these things, is much more of the true Israel. I have to tell you, as a little bit of an aside, uh, I often get a lot of uh, comments on this site about, you know, you guys are not the real Jews. You are Khazarians, or the uh, uh, the true Jews are actually Black Americans. And you know, I like uh, it. Doesn't bother me that much if other people want to claim that they are the true Israel. Uh, you know, it'll all sort itself out in the end, I guess. But what bothers me is like, what does it matter to you? What I call myself. I could call myself an alligator if I want, right? Why is it such a big deal to you if I decide to identify as an alligator? At any rate, that's something that is a very pronounced uh, idea that reverberates throughout the centuries. Um, also, at the same time, uh, Justin Martyr really emphasizes something called the obduracy of the Jews, meaning their stiff-necked nature, their refusal to admit that everything that Justin Martyr and other church fathers are saying is true. And this is why, according to Justin's thought, the Jews deserve more punishment, because really, by refusing to admit the truth, they brought it on themselves. Right. So in other words, the uh, Justin Martyr would, would demand that Jews admit something, and if Jews refuse to admit it, then they should be punished for their obduracy. This is definitely a kind of a not such a great start for Jewish Christian relations, and uh, it is a very important early theme in the Church Fathers. As we shall see, however, there are some very important correctives, especially with Augustine. But before we get to him, let's have a look at the, uh, briefly at any rate, at the work of St. Jean Chrysostom. And look, isn't this amazing? Hey, we have another one of these vrai portraits, another true portrait of St. Jean Chrysostom. This one seems to me rather. Uh, you know, captures a certain element of his thought. At any rate, he is a uh, fourth and early fifth century thinker based in Antioch. And as I mentioned earlier, it is to his work that we owe the very term adversus Judeus because there's a whole cycle of sermons that he delivered uh, in the fourth century that became especially influential in the Eastern Church, but nevertheless set a tone for the entire church as well. The main thing that John Chrysostom was upset with was the participation of Christians and pagans in Jewish public ceremony. We should pause for a second and just think a little bit about Jewish theology here. One of the basic ideas that uh, was articulated long before in Jewish thought was the idea that the uh, children of Noah, that is, uh, non-Jewish society uh, is not bound by the huge number of commandments that Jews are uh, in receipt of. That is where the stuff that Justin Martyr was saying was all carnal, like, you know, the uh, refusal to use electric devices on the Sabbath and things like that. That's all like carnality and that's all physicality. And why don't you guys just let it go already? Uh, but in Jewish thought, uh, that is something which is not mandatory for non-Jews at all. In fact, uh, the Talmud describes seven specific commandments which are incumbent upon all humanity. And by and large, those seven commandments, I think most people would find pretty reasonable. Like, for example, um, no murdering and no adultery, and you've got to set up courts of law to work out your differences, and no cruelty to animals, by the way, is in there, things like that. Like there's seven basic laws, just be a mensch. That's the uh, the Noahide laws. And according to Jewish theology, there is no reason whatsoever for Noahides, that is, the children of Noah, general humanity, to uh, take on any more commandments uh, than they were originally given. If they so choose, then they may, and of course they, the conversion is always open to non-Jews, but there's no impetus, there's no demand for it. They will enter into heaven and receive reward for their righteousness and so on, so long as they observe these seven commandments. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this makes Judaism essentially uh, neutral on the... Uh, participation of non-Jews in their services. Non-Jews may, there are some interesting uh, exceptions to this, which I won't go into in this little class, but, uh, you know, non-Jews are welcome to come to Jewish synagogues. Uh, non-Jews are welcome to participate in all kinds of rituals, and there's, there's nothing really stopping them. It's not like a closed society. And from what we see in Chrysostom's rather venomous 
uh, comments in his sermons, this is exactly what was happening in Antioch, that there's a fairly open society. Non-Jews are getting involved in Jewish activities and going to synagogue even and participating to whatever degree they feel like they want to within Jewish circumstances. And he was really upset with this because this was making it very difficult for Christianity to clearly identify you know, what it's about as opposed to Judaism. The kinds of things he's very upset about is non-Jews, Christians, participating in Sabbath rest, specifically on Saturday, right? Uh, a little bit earlier in the 4th century, the very important Council of Nicaea that, that adjusted the calendar in some significant ways, making sure that Christians would observe the day of rest on Sunday, not on Saturday, the Jewish day of rest, uh, and that uh, Easter would always be unlinked from Passover, and this was apparently not happening. And so he's very upset that uh, a lot of uh, Christians are resting on Saturdays and working on Sundays. Um, he's upset that it appears that non-Jews and Jews are occasionally exchanging gifts on their holidays, uh, which is, is you know, very puzzling to him. This also has some echoes in the Talmud, incidentally, but I'm sure he wasn't aware of those things, uh, that non-Jews were enjoying matzah, <laughs> that Jews would give them their freshly baked Passover matzah. And that's a pretty nice gift. You know, it's like 25 bucks a pound. So they're giving them their, it's essentially bread and it's just flour and water crackers, but nevertheless, it's a seasonal food and so on. Uh, that non-Jews were engaging in feasting and in fasting with Jews, that sometimes Christians would participate in Jewish fasts, like the fast to commemorate the destruction of the temple and so on. Uh, that it's he refers to non-Jews kindling lights on the Jewish festivals, which appears to be uh, some kind of reference to non-Jews acting as a Shabbos goy. The term goy, by the way, can be used in a derogatory sense, depending on how it's used, uh, how it's you know the tone in which it's stated. But it literally means nation. In fact. The Jews themselves are called a goy, a nation, in the Bible and in the liturgy. Um, it's kind of like the word Jew, which I use in generally a neutral or positive sense. But uh, if someone says to you, hey, Jew, in the street, that's probably a, a negative sense. So the, the term Shabbos goy means the Sabbath non-Jew, and uh, it's a non-Jew who will occasionally help out with things that are forbidden for Jews to do on the Sabbath, such as kindling lights. Now, by the way, kids, before you ask a non-Jew to do this for you, there are lots of restrictions on this. Uh, check with your rabbi before you get, you know, before you get excited about having a non-Jew take care of those things for you. Uh, that non-Jews were actually involved in communal prayer with Jews, that non-Jews would come to the synagogue and get engaged in, you know, Rosh Kodesh or Shabbat or whatever prayer was going on, and of course the date of Passover Easter. So, St. John Chrysostom really, you know, in a series of sermons, really lambasted his audience, saying that we have to distinguish ourselves, we have to separate ourselves. These are all terrible things for non-Jews to be doing, Christians specifically, and that the Jews have to, you know, be essentially shunted aside. There's a lot of, uh, of evidence in Chrysostom's sermons that suggests that Jews and Christians actually got along fairly well in Antioch, and he was not happy with that specifically. Now, let us conclude with something a little more positive about the Adversus Judeos tradition, or perhaps more generally about the church fathers as a whole. If I had to pick my favorite church father, which no one has ever asked me to do, but I would definitely say it's St. Augustine of Hippo. He's a fascinating person with an amazing biography, so many cool things about him that... Uh, that it's enjoyable to read about him. This is one particular story, a beautiful Italian you know, uh, envisioning of it, in which uh, St. Augustine was apparently, he had a lot of like personal doubts about theology and religion and so on, and he works us through it in, in, his, work, in his writings. Uh, he, he was like really confused by the Trinity, could not understand how the Trinity could work. So he came upon this young child who in the original version was standing by the ocean in this particular beautiful, beautiful uh, late renaissance picture it's it, it's in the uh, it's in the forest or something and the little child was like with a small spoon scooping out water from the ocean and putting it in a little hole here you can see the little hole right in front of him and there's the halo indicating that it's kind of like a supernatural vision and uh, 
St. Augustine says to him, what are you doing? And you'll never be able to fill up that hole. And the child says, exactly. There are some things which, you know, you can think about and think about and think about, but you'll never get. So therefore, you have to kind of like, you know, let go sort of approach to it. Anyways, let's talk about what uh, St. Augustine had to say about the Jews, which was very useful and positive, actually. One of the things that he says, and again, this is around the same time as Chrysostom, he writes that, wait a second, let's just rethink this whole carnal Israel thing. Because after all, you know, Christianity is built on the foundation of the Torah. And the Torah clearly has God commanding the Jews to do these things, to not eat meat and milk, to observe the seventh day of rest, to not mix wool and linen in their clothing, all kinds of really carnal things. Uh, who are we to say that God is not allowed to make these commandments for Jews? And should we not, you know, praise the Jews for remaining steadfast in their commandments, right? They are not in any way binding on non-Jews, uh, very similar to Jewish theology in this case, but the fact that the Jews would remain steadfast to the Torah, that's a positive thing. Why are you criticizing them? In other words, he's taking issue with a lot of the other church fathers, like uh, Justin Martyr, several centuries earlier. In fact, Augustine writes that Judaism functions as the desk of Christianity that supports all of Christian teachings. It is the foundation, to use another metaphor, and therefore the Jews should be uh, valued as they are without demanding them to convert to Christianity. And this will actually have some uh, explicit reference. He uh, developed something extremely consequential for Jewish history called the Doctrine of Witness. It argues that um, the presence of Jews and their maintenance of the Torah is an essential testimony to the validity of the entire enterprise, including Christianity. That since Judaism is the desk of Christianity, that it is the foundations of Christianity, you can't destroy the foundation and hope the superstructure will continue to stand. That the Jews must be allowed to remain as testimonials to the communication with God that is recorded in the Torah. And in fact, when the Messiah returns in Christian thought, they will once again testify to his identity. So, Contra Justin Martyr, contra Chrysostom, and many other church fathers, St. Augustine is saying that the Jews should be preserved. Now, this is not uniformly positive. They are like, he uses the metaphor of Cain. Uh, you'll recall that uh, early on in the book of Genesis, Cain kills his brother Abel, and uh, then God uh, punishes him by placing a mark upon his forehead and, and causing him to wander forever. And the most important element of that mark is that although there was opprobrium associated with it, he was not to be killed. That anyone who were to slay Cain, the mark was there to indicate they should not be killed, that he should not be killed. That's exactly the way, says St. Augustine, that we should relate to the Jews. Now, that sounds kind of negative, but in reality, this principle, which he articulated using a citation from Psalms, slay them not, was hugely consequential because it essentially defined a church policy that Jews should not be killed, God forbid. They should not be subject to forced conversions because they must, according to the doctrine of witness, remain as Jews. And this is essentially a way of testifying or witnessing to the validity of Christianity in St. Augustine's thought. Now, it is important to note that this uh, particular set of ideas was uh, interpreted in various ways over the next few centuries. Uh, there were certain thinkers, like Pope Gregory the Great, for example, who definitely hewed to St. Augustine's positive approach with you know, huge benefits for Jews. Uh, and there were others who emphasized that the idea of the doctrine of witness uh, only worked if the Jews were in a degraded state. That is, uh, let's keep them around, but they shouldn't be allowed to get ahead, because if they get ahead, then that uh, witness actually uh, stands against Christianity, because it says, hey, look, we should have stayed Jewish. Why should we have converted to Christianity? Look how good the Jews have it. 
Nevertheless, St. Augustine's ideas uh, created sort of like a pathway to allow the Jews to progress through the Middle Ages, and ironically, church law therefore protected Jews because they were within the boundaries of St. Augustine's doctrine of witness. There were notable exceptions to this rule. There were periods when the, uh, the church uh, adopted forced conversions, or at least recognize them ex post facto, and we will unfortunately discuss those in, in future lectures. But by and large, St. Augustine's contribution was actually very, you know, salutary for the survival of the Jews. Okay, that's it for a very quick look at some of the uh, thought of the Church Fathers and uh, the discussion of their impact on Jewish history. Uh, let's look a little bit more now at the interior life of the Jewish world, and specifically at the world of the synagogue and the development of something called piyut. Thanks very much for watching.